Um, Dr. Yellowbird is a citizen of the three allied tribes, the Mandan, Adatsa, and Arikara. He is a professor of sociology and anthropology and director of the Tribal and Indigenous People Studies program in North Dakota State University. Um, he is the author of numerous scholarly activities, book chapters, and the co-editor of four books for Indigenous Eyes Only, the Decolonization Handbook, uh, for Indigenous Minds Only, a Decolonization Handbook, Indigenous Social Work Around the World, Toward Culturally Relevant Education and Practice, and Decolonizing Social Work. I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> His uh, teaching, writing, research, and community work focused on Indigenous peoples, their health, uh, neuro decolonization, approaches, col colonialism, and decolonizing theory, research, and practice. So, welcome. Thank you very much. I'd also like to acknowledge that we do have uh, folks from uh, the Northern BSW program in Thompson. Welcome. And we have a few folks uh, from the Fort Gary campus. So with that, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, well, I was hoping to look right at Michael Hart right now and say this, but uh, I wanted to stay, start by saying thank you to uh, Dr. Michael Hart and the organizers of the sponsors of the conference. And thanks to the staff, the students, and all the helpers that are uh, contributing to the success of the speaker series. Uh, I want to give thanks to all of you that are here today, and those that are sort of tuning in by um, the internet and um, the contributions that everyone is going to make with their presence today. I want to, I want to be really clear about that. Uh, first, began with a reading in my language. Nawa, did you wake on hope? Short prayer. Nawa, did you wake on hope? 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 And I ask for our blessings and for good thoughts and for good minds and hearts uh, for everybody, for people here and for people who are not here, and uh, for all of your relatives. I want to also acknowledge the indigenous people whose territory I'm on. I want to give uh, acknowledgement to the spirits of this place, to the ancestors, to those that have gone before us and those that have, are yet to come. I want to acknowledge also those that are having a difficult time being here and those that are having a difficult time leaving this place and those, because in my culture we believe in reincarnation and rebirth, those that are having a difficult time and reluctance to returning. <laughs> uh, I don't think we blame them. <laughs> I especially want to acknowledge today um, those spirits and those beings that surround us and that are helping us to tell our stories. Among my people, the Arikara, in fact, among most indigenous people, we are taught to give respect to the spirit world, to those that we cannot see and those that have gone before us. I ask now for a moment of silence from each of you to please listen to what they are trying to tell us, what they want us to know. Did you hear them? Why is it necessary to acknowledge in my own decolonization work to remember and to return to the true history of the people <clears throat> that have resided on these lands is all about respect. Decolonization is to remember the invasion of the settlers and their effects on the indigenous people of this territory. It is to remember that these indigenous people have their history, their teachings, their stories of survival, and the reality of that is based upon thousands of years that they have been here. I am from the Arikara and Hidatsa nations, as, a, as our um, opening uh, presenter, our introduction uh, was made clear, and I'm a visitor on these lands. It's incumbent upon me to say this, you know, to describe from my people who I am. On my father's side, I have an association with the ghost and horse society people. On my mother's side, my association is with Bear Society people. On my mother's Hidatsa side, 
I belong to the Low Cap clan. The Low Caps were known for their ability to change and influence the weather by merely looking at it. Their eyes glowed with luminous brightness which could blind others, so they wore caps to cover their eyes. We meditate on these things in the stories along with our clans and societies that serve as our protection against trauma, chaos, confusion, and pain in the world. This morning I wish to visit with you about the evidence base of indigenous healing systems as I have witnessed them and heard from others. An important feature of indigenous people's healing systems is that they are regarded as living beings and are not abstract concepts or conditions. They are alive as the rain is alive, as alive as the heat of the sun and the molten core of Mother Earth. They are alive as the snow, the winds, and the collective experiences that we share as humans, as things unfold long ago and as they are unfolding in this present moment. Our healing systems are powerful and we can use them to guide us or destroy us. Everything is alive, and there are a few things in this world that indigenous people did not consider to have spirit, with an ability to influence who we are and what we do. If we remember that our healing systems are living beings, then we can encounter, negotiate, and live together with Mother Earth and one another without too much trouble. I believe it is incumbent upon me to, to say that the present system of helping is unable to proper, properly facilitate the healing and restoration of indigenous people. Most of us know that despite all the Western evidence-based approaches, all the money, all the efforts, and all the trained professionals, things have only slightly improved for, in a few areas, but have gotten worse in many others. We know that the present system also devours and maims its helpers the ones charged with restoring the well-being of the least fortunate and the most marginalized. Not long ago, while I was attending and speaking at a conference in Northern California that was assembled to address the issues of trauma and addiction, I was able to listen to one of the speakers, a Dr. Charles Garfield, who is an authority on the wounded healer. As he described the wounding of the healer due to the constraints of the system, it sounded eerily like the processes of colonization and subjugation. And guess what? He wasn't talking about indigenous folks. He was talking about non-indigenous professionals with, with advanced degrees and lots of school loans to pay off. That they had been damaged, controlled, manipulated, and silenced by the system in their attempts to heal the suffering of the less fortunate. In so many words, he said, the system does not allow you enough time to eat or pee. There was no time for creativity or mindful approaches that are outside the evidence-based paradigm. He said that you are constantly overloaded with duties and do not have the resources and sometimes the training to address the problems you encounter. In so many words, he said the system of the wounded and the, wound, the wounded and the wounded healer colonize you, colonizes you. It takes hold of you and manipulates your mind into believing it works gets you addicted to its promises of evidence-based practice, DSM diagnosis, and licensing and advanced certifications, that all of these weapons in your professional toolbox should work and should somehow, because you have all these skills and this arsenal, make you immune to all the suffering and pain that you encounter. And then, like the coyote trickster it is, the system proceeds to overload you with volumes and volumes of wounded patients until you are burned out sick, ill, traumatized, medicated, overweight, underweight, spiritually abandoned, and deeply wounded yourself. And if you cannot do the work, you are reprimanded. And if you, if you rebel, you are let go. And if you stay, you soon begin to think of ways to avoid work and wish you were back in school or doing manual labor somewhere. And when conditions at work become unbearable, many are forced to adopt the Homer Simpson approach to work. Quote, if you don't like your job, you don't strike. You just go in every day and do it really half-ass. <laughs> but still you march on and on. And listening to Dr. Garfield, I was reminded that we work in a very sick, sick, sick system. And why shouldn't it be? It's managed and it was created by a trickster. In other words, coyote practices social work. 
<laughs> Why would anyone in their right minds want to work in such a place or support such a system? Well, I submit that we are not in our right minds. And we are all a little more or less insane, doing what we do with what we don't have. My question to those of us that work with Indigenous peoples is, how does it help to use an assembly line approach to help the traumatized, the sick, the dying? Most of us understand such pro approaches we have do not work. Shouldn't we encourage folks to go home where they are loved, and they can be with their tribe, their clan, their village, and they can re-engage or jumpstart their people's traditional healing remedies so that they can heal with dignity? I want to come back to this question following the presentation. This morning, um, I'm going to stop here just for a second. I want to, how much time do I have? <laughs> 40 what? more minutes. 44 minutes? 40 more. Minutes. 40 more minutes, okay. Very precise. <laughs> All right. I just used up one of those. <laughs> okay. So this morning, I want to. I want to discuss um, a few of the evidence-based healing approaches of indigenous people using a decolonizing approach that I borrow from the lens of my people, the Arikaras. To be decolonized is to be able to see the insanity that has taken root due to the present and past circumstances, and as a cure to seek out healing traditions of your people. It is to return to the sacred air, earth, wind, and fire. It is a return to the ceremonies, songs, and the beliefs that sustained your people through the deepest traumas and calamity. It is about returning to the circle from which you came and understanding your story, your history, and your humanity. The healing systems and indigenous knowledge of Aboriginal people in the Western Hemisphere predate the arrival of the Europeans by tens of thousands of years. Indigenous people have the oldest and most reliable evidence-based healing practices and knowledge on the continent. And every day that indigenous people, every day that evidence base of indigenous people emerges. Every day when there is discovery in the field of medicine such as the development of oncolytic viral therapy, which is an emerging treatment modality that rejects the use of poisonous chemotherapy and instead employs replication competent viruses to destroy cancers, we know that, quote, modern medicine has returned to an ancient evidence base that is effective. The context for this story of this art, art, the story of this article um, comes from the scientific magazine from scientific mag magazine and it goes like this. In 1904, a woman in Italy confronted two life-threatening events. First, diagnosis of cancer uh, of the uterine cervix, then a dog bite. The doctors believed the doctors um, delivered the rabies vaccine for the bite and subsequently her enormously large tumor disappeared. The woman lived cancer-free until 1912. Soon uh, thereafter, several other Italian patients with cervical cancer also received the vaccine, a live rabies virus that had been weakened. As reported by Nicola De Pace in, two, in 1910, tumors in some patients shrank, presumably because the virus somehow killed the cancer. And I think this is an incredible story now when we're thinking about how doctors knew this a long time ago, but would not use a natural viral therapy. They know how to use that. Instead, went into producing pharmacological poisonous chemotherapies that actually kill. And now it's kind of making a comeback because people have gotten smart and have begun refusing chemotherapy and are looking for alternative methods. So people have forced the system to move forward and to be creative and to use natural methods. <coughs> Whenever physicians administer psilocybin, which comes from psychedelic mushrooms, to treat terminally ill patients, to reduce their anxiety and depression about impending death, they are reaching into the medical toolbox of indigenous people that used magic mushrooms for millennia to heal the people and to expand the minds and to treat disease and illness. Only now today has this, again, psilocybin become uh, an important part of the the toolbox of the Western medical uh, people. Whenever today's functional, nutritional, and medical specialists recommend that folks eat a low carbohydrate, paleo diet to treat and cure diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and heart disease, they have, in effect, counseled their patients to select foods from the original hunter-gatherer menus of indigenous people. 
Today it's becoming clearer and clearer that the ancient wisdom of indigenous people can cure many, many of today's modern illnesses and sicknesses. My position is that we have known this to be true for millennia. And if indigenous peoples completely return to these practices and ancient knowledge base, a renaissance of healing would occur and much of Western medicine, especially a number of pharmacological approaches, would be rendered obsolete. But for many indigenous people, many of these approaches do not stand on their own. For many, there is an understanding that there are connections to the divine life force. There is an understanding that all things are connected, and spirit inhabits all things found in nature. And that spirit, if properly, pro properly worked with, can heal the mind, the body, and the soul. Indeed, this was a common understanding among many different tribes. This was, of course, before the imposition of colonialism, which turned our worlds upside down and made us forget who we were, and to believe who they said we are. Indigenous medicine and helping approaches rely on previous evidence that demonstrate in the application of the method, success in the application of the method. And what we know from our ancestors is that our healing systems were not only empirical, but also intuitive, focusing deeply on central experiences that incorporated, with permission, the use of various rituals, plants, herbs, foods, songs, ceremonies, and activities, much of them occurring in sacred spaces and natural environments. In today's world, we do not do such things, and we are much poorer for it. We live in artificial environments separated by walls, artificial lights, and sounds. The spirit of indigenous peoples long for return to our ways, which to me is obvious and measured by how many times indigenous professionals, academics, healers, and patients have encouraged Western healing approaches to incorporate our traditions, our ceremonies, and beliefs into their approaches. But as we know, when they are added to mainstream helping, they are secondary, minimal, and greatly overshadowed by the Western thinking and empirical methods. <laughs> now I'm going to have to go back and forth because I don't have a clicker here. Uh, I'm going to talk about now is um, the healing systems model that I've been working on. And I want to draw from this particular model um, <coughs> examples of what I think are really powerful um, evidence-based um, approaches that indigenous people use for thousands of years. <clears throat> So my presentation today uh, examines just a few of the myriad uh, healing systems of indigenous people. I have combined them into a holistic model and we'll discuss a bit about why they worked, why they will continue to work, and why they are necessary to re-embrace. Each has a purpose and I am continuing to ground each um, with historical and empirical evidence of their use and effectiveness. That's been kind of fun because I, as I look at the historical uh, literature I find a lot of different times and places where people were engaging in the use of plants and herbs and songs and ceremonies. And then now we're finding out that Western science is catching up to a lot of this, um, you know, in terms of like wild fruits and something I have a real big interest on is, uh, as I talk about paleo social work is something I've been working on, about how we engage people uh, to return to ancestral diets and what it does for our epigenetics and how it helps uh, our genes to express in healthy ways and that the diets we are on, the standard uh, Western diet, are killing us, causing high levels of inflammation, cancers, diabetes, and a lot of chronic disease, and, and probably the research is pointing towards a lot of neurodegenerative diseases like dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Strong connections with processed foods, packaged foods, but when you put people on um, these uh, ancestral diets that are wild foods, we find you know there are a lot of base compounds in there that have a tremendous amount of uh, activity, anti-carcinogenic activity, cancer, uh, anti-heart um, disease activity, and so on. So um, I could talk about that for a long time, but that's, a, that's another piece here. So what I wanted to do after this, and looking at all of these, like survival narratives, all the way to the biology and the movement and contemplative practice in the space, is I want to, um, but I want to go to this elder here. <clears throat> I want to share this slide of uh, this elderly woman from our reservation. Her name is Maddie Grinnell. And uh, 
She lived far beyond 100 years of age. She passed into the spirit world back in the mid-70s and was born before the American Civil War that took place in the mid-1960s. She was probably somewhere 110 years old. Um, we, we don't see Indian people living that long today. <coughs> That's kind of a rarity, but that was not such a rarity back in the day when people were living healthy off the land and using their medicines. And for me, she serves as the exemplar of understanding how belief and use of traditional Indian medicine work for people. Her example runs the span of the entire healing systems model. Um, I believe she lived a long time in a healthy state because she attended to each one of the different domains on the model. And her most well-known quote is, I still use Indian medicine. That's why I'm over 100 years old. So when you visit the archives and the census records, uh, like I have back in the time when she was around, you're going to find that uh, there was a long, uh, the life expectancy was very different. People died from very different diseases than they do today. Back then, people would die from injuries, or they may die from some kind of infectious disease or something. Today, we're dying from chronic diseases very preventable chronic diseases. And I think, if, you know, as I, as I study this more and more, we have in the DNA uh, of indigenous people uh, capacity to live a really long time. I've looked at a number of studies. There was a study done by the Office of Technological Assessment in the 1980s, and I, I looked at that database for a while, and I found out that once Native people sort of move past the year 80, they start, they have the ability to outlive most other uh, races. They're healthy at that level when they pass age 80. So, you need to make it 80. <laughs> <laughs> so, when I talk about Maddie, I think about you know, all this at the top. We see these survival narratives. We see the traditional foods. We see the contemplative practices, the movement, the biology and genes. These are things I want to talk about today. Um, and I have about 26 minutes, so uh, spirit world. So um, I'm, I'm writing. I'm writing this as I go along. This is another publication I'm working on, but I'm really digging into it deep to kind of try to show social work that if you really want to practice social work, not practice coyote social work, then you have to really look to the wisdom of indigenous people because it's there. If you don't look there, it's malpractice in my my book. So, as you look at this model, you can see at the very top of the circle that holds the uh, narratives of survival, which I refer to as our first words. At one time among our tribes, all activity began with the first words of the stories that describe who we are, what we believe, and our relationship with all. The first words recount the origin of all things as our ancestors have understood them. These first words prime our minds and our bodies and our spirits for healing. With our beginning words, we disarm colonialism and engage in cultural and spiritual decolonization. That reminds, of us, reminds us of our place, identity, where we came from, and where we are going. It reminds us of the struggles it took to get there and, how we, and that we must persist. We must always persist for ourselves and the generations yet to come. Beginning words, when spoken properly, restore us. They heal us. There is nothing more powerful than the beginning words that are meant and directed to heal. My first words are the beginning words from an individual named Four Rings, who was an elder and a traditional priest of one of our sacred bundles that told our Genesis, our Genesis story, that began as, uh, which began as thoughts in Mother Earth. To, to the people that we know today. There is much ceremony that goes with this story and, the li and linear conferences and structured limits of time do not enable me to share all our traditional Genesis story that was recounted at all major events and during times that were good and not so good. I begin with how we understood our relationship with Mother Earth and how we began evolving. And I quote uh, Four Rings. All the different kinds and tribes of living things, living beings, including the human race, the various kinds of fishes, reptiles, birds, mammals, all things which live and move in the water and on land, all the tribes of flowers, grasses, of trees, of shrubs, and every kind of plant, all living things in the world were first contained and took substance in the womb of Mother Earth. 
With the first steering of life in this state of quiescence, there came to all living things an apprehension of the imperfection of their state, and they felt more and more an impulse to emerge from their passive condition, from darkness and restraint, to come out into the light and to attain liberty of movement over the surface of the earth. At that time of beginning, there were none of the living creatures as we see them now. There was no vegetation, no fishes were in the water, no birds or any insects in the air, nor were any animals. There was no living creatures of any kind in the light of the sun on the lap of Mother Earth. All were still covered beneath her bosom. All things were still in embryo. But the living creatures were exerting themselves and making all endeavors, for they strongly aspired to come up into the light and attain freedom. So they constantly continued to grope and pray and to do their best to explore and find some way to accomplish the purpose. The story goes on and on, but my comments here is like, what we learn from the story and approach is that our ancestors taught us that we have humble beginnings. That all begins with a thought. It also teaches us that we have an intimate connection with Mother Earth. We learn from this short excerpt that we must have aspirations and purpose, and that we must exert ourselves in all that we do, and that freedom from suffering is possible with continued effort and prayer. What we learn from this story is that as we recount our origin, it helps to remind our people of our identity. It serves to ground our knowledge of ourselves, and to remember that despite all the struggles we encounter, we can overcome them with the appropriate efforts. Second words. My second words are stories of power gained from the spiritual and natural worlds. It is a power that is obtained through humility, fasting, prayer, and a deep respect for the elements. It is a power that is only accorded to holy people that use it for the good of the people and all living things. My grandfather Bear's Teeth was a holy man and a seer among our people. He could make it rain, and he could make things appear and disappear out of thin air. He made prophecies to the people based upon his dreams through sustained prayer and ceremony, by his counters with beings from the, from the spirit world and from his observation of our own people and the whites that, who came into our village. Many of his prophecies have come to pass, and it appears that others are being fulfilled. The Calling of the Rain. This is a, a narrative about him calling the rain in. I have prepared for um, a woman who has told me to hold a ceremony call the rain. Her crops are dried up and I have consented to hold the ceremony. We went across the Missouri River to Bearteeth's Lodge. Calicos were brought into the lodge and these Bear's Teeth placed upon the altar, the rattle that belonged with his ceremony. In front of the altar he made a circle of black lariat rope and in the middle he placed a piece of flint stone. In front of this ring was a bowl with water in it. He has all the elements there. You can see his earth, and his fire, and his plants. There was also placed in front of the altar live coals. Sweet grass was placed upon it. Bear's teeth passed the gourds over the smoke and placed them back onto the altar. He took the string and the first and the stone flint and passed them through the smoke. By the flint stone, but the flint stone was uh, also laid on a skin of a skunk. Now singing was begun. The songs related to the, cre the, to the creating of a rainstorm and the rainstorm traveling through the country. Again, other songs were sung which were about the creation of mankind. Then he told the men who were sitting by him that they must sing all night. These men sang all night. In the morning they kept up the singing. Bear's teeth then went out and brought a black pony that he had placed um, in front of the lodge he took some red paint from his sacred bundle and made red marks representing lightning upon the horse's hips and also upon its shoulders, putting some red paint over the horse's ears, the root of its tail, and also <coughs> upon its tail. 
Bear's Teeth then went in and sang some songs about the horse. Again, the singing was resumed, and this time it was about the rainstorm coming through the land, coming through the valleys, to the mountains, the hills, timbers, and hollows, and crossing the creeks. Each time they got through singing, Bear's Teeth would say, the rainstorm is coming. Once in a while, he went out and saw no clouds, but the singing was kept up, and Bear's Teeth kept on saying that the rainstorm is coming west. Bear's Teeth all this time was sitting in the lodge saying that the storm was up, and that it was coming, and that it was coming swift, that there would be not only rain, but thunder, and that the thunders would claim, claim meaning they would strike somebody's horse, which it did. Before sunset, it was raining hard, and down the Missouri Valley, it rained very hard, and the wind was high, and the thunder sounded very loud. <coughs> Just before morning, the rainstorm seemed to have passed. Bear's teeth was satisfied. He jumped upon his pony, his whistle about his neck. He went through the village singing a song that might be called a victory song, for the spirits of the rain had listened to his singing and the prayers, and they had sent the rainstorm, as he had prophesied they would do, and he was satisfied. He returned to the lodge, took the holy pipe, and went out to the lodge. The smoking he did outside so that nobody could see him offering smoke to the spirits. After this, he came in and cut up small pieces of meat. Just how many? Nobody knows. Then he went out and offered small pieces of meat, giving each a prayer to the spirits. When this was done, he entered the lodge sat down, and the meat and bread were brought in and distributed among all the people. All the gifts that were given at this ceremony were strung in a long pole and placed west of the lodge in the timber to the spirits who had sent the rain. Bear's teeth then made a talk. He said that the spirits had listened to his prayer for rain, that asking for rain was a hard thing, and he did not like to do this so often. But when the people needed rain, he was willing to do it. This is the third time that Bear's Teeth has called rain, and the rain has come as he prophesied. The people have come to look upon Bear's Teeth as a great prophet. Bear's Teeth said that people should be thankful to the spirits and not him, for the rain, <laughs> that they ought to know that the spirits were watching over them. But all was through their own doing that the spirits did not notice them. For they were not believers in the spirits, nor did they think of them. For the ways of the white man had come among the people, and the young people followed too much the ways of the white people by saddling their ponies and tying their slickers behind their saddles and riding around like cowboys. Bear's teeth said, We old people should remember the spirits and pray to them until we are no more. When we are dead and gone, these young people can have their cowboy ways. My grandfather understood that spirits inhabited all things found in nature. And to join this flow of energy, one must dedicate their lives to learning the language of the natural world. He was reluctant to change the course of the rain and the thunder since he believed that humans must encounter and adapt to the trials of nature and the difficulties of life. And when humans interfered in the natural order of things, there was generally a price to pay. Yes, his theme continues to be that we must engage in ritual, be humble, and we must persist, and we must not forget our connections to the spirit world. His ceremony reminds us that our collectivist behavior brings us all together to boost the ceremonies to guarantee success in indigenous evidence-based practice. Um, slide 8 is uh, called a collectivist uh, rikaraz or collectivist culture. <clears throat> in fact, my model indicates that collectivist culture and behavior is a hallmark in wellness among indigenous people and is, is present in my healing system. Why do I include it? Because recent studies in cultural neuroscience have advanced our understanding that culture and genes co evolve. And for many groups, especially in indigenous and tribal people, operating in a collectivist rather than an individualistic manner insulates them from social and physical illness. <coughs> Here's some evidence based on Western science. 
the work of uh, Professor Joan Chiao uh, from the University uh, or from Northwest University has so far demonstrated that that as cultural values evolve, they become adaptive and influence the social and physical environments under which genetic selection operates. In her study, she has found that collectivist cultures have a higher frequency of what is called the serotonin transporter functional polymorphism. And the number for this is 5-HTTLPR. So that's the technical description, of it. but it's uh, what they call these um, mutated genes, right? The indigenous people have mutated genes. Uh, it's mutated, I guess, to be collectivist, right? So. Um, she has found evidence that the carriers of the S allele collectivist gene predict global prevalence of anxiety and mood, mood disorder, meaning that we're, su we're subject to that, right? <clears throat> Further analysis, though, indicate that increased, <coughs> that increased, um, the increased carriers of this gene have decreased anxiety and mood disorder prevalence when they function using collectivist cultural values. When you actually work together as tribal people, that deactivates that problem gene. Right? In other words, when indigenous people engage in culturally prescribed collectivist activities such as ceremony, ritual, group prayer, and social activities such as traditional dancing and giveaways, they are protected from illness. Chiao and her colleagues have found that collectivist practices buffer genetically susceptible populations from increased prevalence of affective disorders. On the other hand, when indigenous people are pressed to be individualistic, they become sick. With this information, it should now come as no surprise why indigenous people have higher rates of substance abuse, violence, suicide, mortality, depression, and anxiety. And I think this is one thing to point out in medical and social work practice is that it's very, very, and it may be impossible to heal some of the populations unless these practices engage in a truly collectivist approach outside of an agency. That's a challenge to people now. So in some sense, it renders the office, and seeing an office as an individual, for many people, virtually worthless, useless. This is what I'm finding as I, as I read the research. Next words. Um, my next words speak to the knowledge of our grandmothers in regard to child rearing and their nutritional needs. And this is the paleo social work part. Traditional foods are a key part of my healing and systems model. When my grandmother, my father's mother, was nearly 90 years old, she was interviewed on one of our local tribal radio stations in the late 1980s. She was asked many questions of what it was like to be born in the late 1800s and to be raised after this time. She told of how the people were united <coughs> and helped and supported one another, and how ceremonies and traditional ways of life were at the center of the village. Times, she said, were good, but they were hard. When she was asked what was the biggest change that happened to our people, she misunderstood the question, thinking that the interviewer was asking when the world that our people knew came to an end. <laughs> she became teary-eyed and said, the end of our world came when the women of the village were forced by the whites to feed our babies cow's milk. It came after we abandoned our village ways of life, after we forgot our stories, who we were. Excuse me, my throat's in the ground. After this, we started getting sick. <coughs> my grandmother's insights were keen. She grew up during a time when indigenous people understood their biology and the cultural values associated with eating. She and others in our tribe understood the white man's foods, drinks, and methods of feeding would make us sick and were unnatural to our bodies. She also understood that when the baby is taken from the breast of the mother and placed on an artificial feeding apparatus, the plastic baby bottle, the child would lose the intimate connection to her first teacher, her first link to life. She would lose the opportunity to build her immune system from all the, um, from the, all the protective factors she could get from her mother. 
When I was a child, I remember that after many of the mothers in our tribe began to feed their babies cow's milk rather than breastfeed them, the children began to suffer bouts of serious gastrointestinal distress, including constipation, diarrhea, and malnutrition. One of the remedies that was recommended to resolve a baby's constipation by mainstream doctors was to add a lot of corn syrup to the milk, which would cause the baby to have diarrhea. Some of you may remember that. I think that was, that was pretty big when I was a kid. Today we see incredible rates of obesity, diabetes, gastrointestinal disorders, and extremely high rates of lactose intolerance, probably all triggered to the epigenetic process of introducing these poisons to babies at that age. So I want to move on to the power of the mind now. The power of the mind to heal has a long, long evidence base among indigenous people. Contemplative practices are another key part of the model. I want to relate a relevant story to you about how the power of the mind was accorded in Yupik Eskimo culture. Last year I was invited to co-teach a community change processes course at Kuskokwim campus. My invitation was the result of a book for indigenous minds only in the colonization handbook that I had created. My charge was to, to discuss my theory of neurodecolonization, how we can uh, engage important brain networks by doing particular cultural activities to change how the structure of our brains and its functions in order to uh, overcome the oppressions of colonialism. On the second morning before things started, I read a passage in the book, Elevut, uh, Our Yupik World and Weather, a gift from the Yupik, Yupik student, uh, it was a gift from the Yupik students. It reads, they say that a person's mind is powerful. They told us that a person's gratefulness is powerfulness and that their hurt for feelings are also powerful. And we must always be mindful of what we are thinking and to think before we speak and act. And at that moment I realized that they were teaching me about neurodecolonization. You pick Elder Esther, Esther Green spoke of the power of the mind using visualization. <coughs> People have a long history of using their minds and visualization in order to create change and healing. She says, in the morning when you wake up, first thing you do is wash your face and imagine, away, and imagine that you wash away the negativity and re reveal your smile and well-being. Of course, you can't do that here, right? You can't wash your face. Because <laughs> 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 you boil your water. <laughs> All right, um, and imagine that you wash away the negativity and reveal your smell, smile and well-being. She's like uh, 85 years old, very energetic woman. Next, wash your ears and imagine that they open up to hear all that you need to hear and that will help you. After you wash your eyes, imagine that, you will, uh, that it will give you the ability to see all you must see. Wash your throat so that you can say all that is necessary to say. Do this every day, every morning. Wake up and the change will come. I've been doing this for many, many years. The next slide is uh, a Ritwara woman in the garden. And I'm starting to get to my last words here. My people were hunter-gatherers as well as agriculturalists. We raised corn, beans, tobacco, pumpkins, sunflower seeds, squash, and melons. To ensure a good crop, the women of the tribe would sing special songs, lullabies to the seeds and the baby plants as if they were their own children. Long, during the long cold winters, they would get gather in a woman's lodge, and along with the baby and little girls and young women, the grandmothers and mothers and aunties would sit in repose and collectively visualize all the different plants growing and giving life to the people. But the times were not always good. Long, long ago, Mother Corn, <coughs> The female spirit of the corn <coughs> and the protector of the people came to our villages when times had become very difficult with starvation, sickness, and dramatic changes in our climate. She came among the people to pity them because they had been reduced to very small numbers. Their children were nearly all dead. They looked like skeletons and they were covered with sores. Many had given up and resorted to taking their own lives. 
She heard them crying and distraught, asking the powers of the universe to intervene on their behalf. <laughs> none of the ceremonies, none of the medicines had reversed their condition. She felt pitiful for these helpless humans and appeared to them to do what she could to help. She knew that she could only appear to them four times during the history of the people. The last time would constitute the end of the world as we humans now know it. Now this was her third time. It is said that she will come again soon as the spirit of the plants to warn the, pe to warn the people of the impending dangers and how they might survive them. And I, like it, I don't have time to do a long editorial of that, but a lot of people say that time has come now during this climate change. And this is actually the words that they had used when they told this story about climate change earlier. So we know that it'd be at least you know, 16,000 years ago when there was an ice age happening here. We sat, um, she sat among the people listening for a long time to their expressions of grief. She quieted them and told each to sit and to listen to what she had to say. She began by stating, long, long ago, you were instructed that this world you wished to live in was going to be filled with much beauty and sorrow. Times would be good, times would be difficult. Your tribe was told that it would be this way. Yet you decided to come to this life, and it seems you have forgotten the original teachings of what to do when things become hard. You must remember that things cannot and do not change just because you are suffering. I must remind you that I cannot change them. Only you have the power to do so. So here again is the teaching you must never forget. You must always remember that when times get very hard, and you feel you cannot go on, you can call upon your relatives in the spirit world. They will help you. They listen. They've always listened. <laughs> if you call upon them, they will come and they will sing you brave songs and hold you up in times of weakness and distress. Now listen. Do you hear them? Sing with them. Still on my last words here. My grandmother once said to a gathering of our relatives that had come together to attend the burial of one of our own, we were meant to die. But before we do, we must learn how to live, to live with others, other people, other tribes, the beings that walk on four legs, all upon the earth, swim in the waters, those that fly, and those we cannot see. She said that. It is said that the hardest person to live with is yourself. Because we always want things to be a certain way. She said that when we die, we must do the ceremony that helps the deceased return to where they came from, to the southeast where the sun rises. She said this is where all life begins. That is why our lodges and our ceremonies face the east. It is the doorway to our destiny. And to all of our people, and all of our people walk this path when it is our time to go home to the spirit world. She said, we have been walking towards the west where the sun sets in this life since we were born. Maybe our journey has been long, maybe it has been short. It doesn't matter. Because when we die, our people believe that we have reached the west and now we must turn around and go home. What these stories describe are narratives of survival. They tell us in simple but powerful ancient evidence-based ways how we can, we can come to understand our traumas and the chaos of the world and what we can draw from to overcome them. The stories tell of the power of belief, the connections we have to the spirit world, where we come from and how we survive difficulties, even more difficult than those we face today. None of these stories take place in a hospital, clinic, or an office building. They take place in the natural world of light and dark, of heat, wind, and cold, of hunger, of starvation, of war, and peace. If we return to these stories, these traditions, and fly over the cuckoo's nest, we will heal, we will recover. The narratives of indigenous people teem with stories of survival triumph against all odds. And like the industry of historical trauma that indigenous people and non-indigenous people are using to phrase frame freezes as survivors 
uh, and victims in a quagmire of our own inability to heal, despite what all the mainstream evidence-based approaches offer us, our histories of survival demonstrate that if we pay attention to who and what we are, we will overcome. Our stories tell us how we can and must insulate ourselves from the coming traumas and chaos that patrol and reside in the human condition. Many one-sided myths and distortions of indigenous people perpetuated by the mainstream master narrative must be decolonized. I believe it is time to share these stories and the prophecies of things to come. Thank you. talk about that if anyone has any questions uh, about any of the uh, material that I've covered. Do you, yeah. do you know, I don't know, it's, uh, going back to like the garden and natural, and things have been like hybrids and changes in vegetation elements, how do you go back to real natural? You know, there, there's in some ways maybe it's, 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 we have to live in the contemporary time that we have. In some, some ways, if we leave seeds alone, they devolve to their state of wellness. And in some ways, we know that there are uh, heirloom seeds that ex still exist, that people have kept to the perpetuity that can still be replanted. So, uh, the power behind all of that, though, I think for me, is, is, is when the plants are joined by, in our particular case, the women of the village, is they sing to the plants, they sing to the seeds. We now know in, in uh, some research now we know that plants and seeds are not you know inanimate objects they respond to sound there's even you know research now that's been done on great britain that shows that plants have this facility to communicate with one another it's one of their defenses that they've developed against herbivores rather than being eaten they sort of signal to one another whenever a herbivore comes into their territory it's one of their what they call the, uh, the defenses against herb uh, herbivory uh, it's a whole study that's done in, uh, the ethnosciences, plant sciences. When an herbivore comes into their uh, into their domain, they actually send like messages across through the root system, telling other plants there's danger, right? So this is kind of what people are theorizing right now. It's interesting because when you study the plants and you look at them, the plants actually can will shrivel some, and they will kind of turn away and sort of you know uh, so they look less nut nutrient right to the, to the predator. This is the science that's going on now outside of you know backyards and different places of these uh, folks that know you know what's going on but of course we, we as indigenous people have some kind of facility to understand that and accept that that plants do communicate. Any other uh, thoughts or questions? Do you ever speak to youth groups or younger populations? Yeah, yeah sure. I just want to ask you a question, maybe. Does this make, do you think this makes sense for social work, helping professions to understand this stuff? It's a paradigm that it needs to be explored in more detail. Okay. Collect, collecting the local stories are really a, a priority for each region. That, right. that has to be really prioritized you have to connect to what you're, you're, you're telling us today. Right, and I think that to me, that's kind of like what we try to accomplish in our books on decolonization for the indigenous. Uh, mind, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, eyes only kind of things is to have people sort of discuss that. What does it mean to have, you know, to recover those kinds of bases of knowledge? How can you recover them? What kind of effect do they have in the community, right? And I, and I try to underline, like, in a lot of my work is that, you know, as I said earlier, the approaches that are being used, you know, have maybe made some slight differences in some Aboriginal communities. But overall, we know that things have maybe gotten worse in many different areas. And we know now from the genetic stuff I'm talking about, you know, there's, it's not just like we're talking to people, we're also talking to a DNA that's ancient, right? And we're talking to this DNA not only through words, but through ceremony, through food, through all these other experiences that help it, you know, um, to express the epigenetic, you know, um, part of our, our being so that when it's activated, we become healthier. Or when it's de deactivated, then the disease goes away. So those are the ceremonies, yeah. We have to figure out what those are. 
are, are, is, is it possible to get those stories through ceremony and your opinion? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, those stories um, have always sort of been available to us. Just like, you know, I, I, you know part of my training as a, you know, someone in Western science and so on for a long time would be to be skeptical about whether or not my grandfather could make it rain. I'm no longer skeptical about that, or about how people can draw information, you know, from these things that we can't see. Just like we know now today where the science is moving towards plants talk, right? All the vegans say, oh, you meat eaters, you're making them suffer. It's like, hey, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I think that little plant says, yay, when you pull it out of the <laughs> I think we have an effect, you know, with this, this exchange of those, those systems, right? So, uh, if there's... You yeah. could say that maybe part of healing, or maybe a trauma, would be learning one's original language, that guy's adopted out, so that's why I'm asking. It's, it's, it's one of the things, you know, and I think uh, what, what neuroscience show us is that repetition and, and, and uh, meaning, uh, making from what the experience that you're having and, and focusing really deeply on that, you know, helps retrain the brain so that it can override traumas. There's a lot of stuff I talk about in terms of neurodecolonization that I'll talk about in the workshop later today uh, about how that works. I'll show pictures of brain images and show people involved in ceremony what parts of the brains are activated. And what it does to a person's well-being when they are activated. So whether it's language, the language part of the brain, or whether it's uh, you know uh, our hope or optimism, whatever it is, it's it's there. And you know it's interesting because these people are not just doing these things just like haphazardly. We know that they have the evidence base that was you know that had uh, was successful over and over again in why they did these things. And they would report healing, they would report wellness, they would report you know all these kinds of things. So. With that, I want to just, again, thank you for allowing me to be here and say a few words, and uh, I'm uh, I'm uh, Michael Hart, so I'm sorry I missed the introduction. I was giving a presentation elsewhere, so it was nice to get it. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, that you took the time to be here, so a little token of our appreciation. I'll talk to you more about the real stuff later. Um, I wanted to give thanks for those who uh, joined us from uh, Thompson and the Fort Gary campus, and uh, for all of you who came to attend and to be here. This is one of uh, a number of presentations we hope to have in the next uh, few years at least with the uh, Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Knowledge and Social Work. Uh, speaker series. So uh, I'm, the, I'm the research chair in digital arts and social work. So I thank you for uh, being here and please watch out for further ones. And uh, one, again, thank you for joining us. We look forward to your thank afternoon. You. Thank you, Dr. Hart.